In this presentation, we'll be discussing diabetes insipidus and SIADH. These are both disorders of antidiuretic hormone. So because we'll be talking about disorders of ADH in this presentation, we'll start out just getting a really clear understanding of what ADH is and then talk about what happens when there's too much or too little ADH and what our patients will look like as well as how we take care of them. So this slide at first glance looks very, very simple, but this slide is critical for you to make sense of disorders with ADH. So let's take a look. We have antidiuretic hormone. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, basically results in a process of antidiuresis. So when you think about antidiuresis, that means anti-urination or less urination. And that results in more water staying in the body rather than being diuresed or leaving the body. So rather than having to walk yourself through that process every time you see ADH, an easier way to remember this is just think ADH means water in the body. So when I say ADH, you think water in the body. Therefore, if I say lots of ADH, you should think lots of water in the body. And if I say too little ADH, you should think too little water in the body. So lots of ADH would mean a patient is fluid overloaded and low amounts of ADH would mean they're dehydrated. So this seems very simple now, but it will help you later when you start to see abnormalities with ADH. Now, one more thing. If we have lots of ADH, lots of water in the body, where is the water not? So we're anti-diuresing and that's what's causing there to be lots of water in the body. So therefore there is not a lot of water in the urine. And the same thing goes for too little ADH. That means too little water in the body. And therefore where did all the water go? it went into the urine. So when you think ADH, lots of water in the body, if I have lots of ADH, the opposite is true for the urine. So there's this inverse relationship with ADH. If there's water in the body, it's not in the urine. If there's not water in the body, it's in the urine. So let's review ADH in a little more depth. We've discussed that ADH means water in the body because antidiuretic hormone means antidiuresis, causing less urination, which causes more water to stay in the body. We've also established that if there is more ADH, more water in the body, then the water is not going to be leaving through the urinary tract as much. So thus we have lots of ADH, lots of water in the body, therefore less water leaving the body, less water in the urine, and vice versa. Little ADH, little water in the body, because it's leaving through the urinary tract, more water in the urine. Now, looking at ADH itself, it's produced in the brain, in the hypothalamus, and actually also stored in the brain in the posterior pituitary. And further, when ADH is released, it activates our kidneys, specifically that distal renal tubule. And this makes sense, right? If we're talking about urination and water in or out of our body, we should probably act on the kidney. So when, is, when ADH is released, it acts on that distal renal tubule in the kidney and causes reabsorption of water, which explains our water in the body sink. So another thing to be aware of is that high doses of ADH actually cause vasoconstriction. And when I say high doses, this often refers to actually administering ADH IV, giving our patients synthetic ADH. And some of you may have been in the ICU seeing uh, patients on vasopressors, things like norepinephrine, phenylephrine, etc. And these are given to increase a patient's blood pressure, uh, often a patient who's in shock or they're really hypotensive. Well, another vasopressor is called vasopressin, and vasopressin is actually ADH. So you can guess when we give vasopressin, it's like giving ADH. We see less urine output, more water in the body, which you can imagine would increase blood pressure just by increasing the amount of volume. And since we're giving it in higher doses, we see vasoconstriction in the periphery, further increasing that patient's blood pressure. Now let's pause for a second. Why do we care about this? Why do we need to know that ADH is made and stored in the brain? Well, if a patient suffers a head injury or even has a brain tumor, we immediately start to worry about obvious things like intracranial pressure and other things like that, but we rarely think about urination right off the bat. However, we need to be thinking about how a head injury could have affected the hypothalamus or the posterior pituitary. Thus, head injuries or malignancies in the brain 
actually can cause problems with ADH. So moving down here, we've established that ADH regulates water balance, right? Lots of ADH, lots of water in the body, little ADH, little water in the body. But because of that, we need to examine something called osmolality. And osmolality basically means stuff in a fluid. More stuff in a fluid leads to a higher osmolality, and less stuff in a fluid leads to lower osmolality. So for example, I could measure the osmolality of orange juice. Let's say orange juice concentrate with a bunch of pulp in it. That's going to have a much higher osmolality than, let's say, watered down and strained orange juice. So osmolality is affected by not only the amount of stuff in the substance, but also the amount of water. So thinking back to ADH and water in the body, we can actually measure the serum osmolality or the amount of stuff in the blood. Remember, serum means blood. So look at those two red and blue boxes off to the side of your slide here. Now in the top box, we have lots of water and not as much stuff, that red box. The patient would have a high or low serum osmolality. Take a minute to think about it. So this would be low because there is more water than stuff in the blood. Now looking at the box below, we now have less water in the blood and more stuff. So more stuff means higher osmolality. So pause the slide for a second and see if you can guess which box is referring to lots of ADH and which one is referring to less ADH. All right, so lots of ADH means lots of water in the body. Which one has lots of water? It's that top box. So you have just learned that patients with high amounts of ADH will actually have high amounts of water in the body diluting their blood and causing low serum osmolality, low amounts of stuff. Now looking at the bottom box, we have less water in the blood. So less water in the body means more stuff and higher serum osmolality. Now before we move on, I challenge you to think about one more thing. If my patient has high amounts of ADH, what will their urine osmolality be? Take a second to think about it, pause the presentation and consider your answer. So lots of ADH means lots of water in the body, low serum osmolality because all the water is diluting everything. Now lots of water in the body means less water in the urine. So I'm going to be making more concentrated urine, meaning there's more stuff in the urine. So when we have lots of ADH, we will actually have high urine osmolality and then vice versa with low ADH. So one more thing before we get to labeling specific disorders with ADH. One question, when does our body naturally release ADH? And to really answer this, we're technically asking, when does the body want to keep more water in the body? Well, it's going to hold on to more water and secrete ADH to do that when we don't have enough water in the body. When our body recognizes there's a sign, hmm, there's a sign that there's not enough blood volume or not enough water in the body. So think for a minute, what are all of those signs that we could be low on water in the body or low on blood volume? Well, a really easy one is hypotension. So if our baroreceptors sense that we have low blood pressure, our body will want to increase the amount of blood pressure by increasing the volume. And by doing that, they will secrete ADH. So aside from hypotension, what other signs are there? Well, if our blood is really concentrated, that also tells me that our blood volume is low. Think about dehydration. The water has left. What is left behind is more concentrated and lower volume. So we just learned about this. More concentrated blood has an increased serum osmolality. So an increased serum osmolality or too much stuff and not enough water in the blood, that's going to trigger ADH release. One of the specific elements of that stuff, that high serum osmolality that our body is sensitive to, is sodium. So also, if we have high levels of sodium, that kind of tells the body there's a lot of stuff in this blood. There's a lot of high serum osmolality and also high levels of sodium. And that could mean that my blood is really concentrated. There's not enough water. So it makes my sodium levels look high. 
So here's another one, high serum osmolality and specifically high serum sodium, both of those will kind of trend up and down together. And when they're both high, they will both trigger release of ADH. Tell, basically our body's saying, I need to dilute this blood. Now other triggers can include trauma or pain, any type of stress. ADH and keeping water in the body will help increase our blood volume, which helps with increasing blood pressure, which sounds a lot like our fight or flight response. So a patient may have a totally normal serum osmolality, so that wouldn't trigger the ADH, but they just endured a really stressful or traumatic event. Their body might start to think, hmm, in this stress stressful event, it would be helpful to have a very stable blood pressure. Let's hold on to some water. And then it releases ADH. Also, you can see here just a couple of examples of drugs that can actually trigger ADH as well. So for example, if I give my patient chemotherapy, I need to be watching their urine output. I need to be sensitive to whether they are triggering too much release of ADH due to this drug I'm giving them. So keep in mind, this is just a list of some things that can cause release of ADH. You do not have to have all of them. It may just be one or two things that trigger release of ADH. So now we can jump into disturbances with ADH or antidiuretic hormone. So we keep repeating lots of ADH, lots of water in the body, little ADH, little water in the body. Well, now we get to give those two disturbances in ADH labels. So here we have DI or diabetes insipidus. That is the label to not having enough ADH. So that relates to not having enough ADH or low ADH. SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH relates to having too much ADH or high ADH. Now the way I like to remember these two is DI only has two letters and SIADH has five letters. So the one with lots of letters relates to lots of ADH. That's our SIADH. And DI only has two letters. So less letters relates to less ADH. So let's begin with DI or diabetes insipidus. Remember, DI, less letters, less ADH, less water in the body. So thinking back to the beginning of our discussion, less water in the body means the water is leaving the body through the urinary tract. So diabetes insipidus leads to less water in the body and more water in the urine or polyuria. Now there are two major causes of DI. We are either low on ADH, so we're not making enough, or we're making enough, but we're not responding to the ADH that is being released. So in a sense, we're insensitive to ADH in that second possibility. So we either have an ADH deficiency, not making enough, or we have an ADH insensitivity. We're not sensitive or we're not re responding to the ADH we're making. But either way, ADH is not working enough in the body, leading to little water in the body, lots of water in the urine. So now let's look at those two causes of diabetes insipidus. If we have a deficiency in ADH, so we're not making enough, where is ADH normally made? It's made in the hypothalamus and it's stored in the posterior pituitary. So this is really the cause of this problem of ADH deficiency. So if we have a deficiency in ADH, we're calling this neurogenic, meaning coming from the brain. We also call it central DI. Think of how our brain is part of our central nervous system. So central diabetes insipidus can be caused by brain problems. For example, for example, cerebral edema, tumors, infections in the brain, even tuberculosis that has affected the brain. It can also be idiopathic, meaning we don't really know why the hypothalamus is not producing enough ADH, but it isn't. Now remember our second cause. If the brain is fine and we're making plenty of ADH when we need to, our kidneys may not be responding. So if our kidneys, that distal renal tubule, is not responding to ADH, that would mean that we now have diabetes insipidus related to ADH insensitivity. Thus we call ADH insensitivity nephrogenic, meaning it's the kidney's problem, not the brain. So nephrogenic DI might occur in patients with kidney disease or with specific drugs such as lithium or amphotericin, which are pretty intense. It's an intense antifungal drug. Both of these can be nephrotoxic. So bottom line, diabetes insipidus has two major causes, either central or neurogenic, meaning we're not making enough and it's the brain's fault, or nephrogenic, 
meaning our kidneys are not responding to ADH that's being re- produced and we have ADH insensitivity. All right, so now we have our patient with diabetes insipidus. They're sitting in front of us. What are they going to look like? And what do we need to do for them? So remember, DI, less letters, less ADH, less water in the body, more water in the urine. Think about all of that, and that should help you anticipate the clinical manifestations of diabetes insipidus. They will be voiding a lot. The water is leaving the body. So we see polyuria, upwards of 40 liters in a day. And that urine is getting rid of a lot of water for us. So we see pale, dilute urine, where we are emptying their Foley bag a lot, for instance. Now, because the water has left the body, what does the body look like? We've talked about the Foley bag, but what does our patient look like? Well, we're low on water, so we see all of those signs of hypovolemia and dehydration. So things like hypotension with tachycardia, weight loss because of all the fluid loss, dry mouth, thirst. Now, if we're dehydrated, we have low intravascular volume, so our preloads will be low. Our CVP and our wedge pressures will be low. What else? Well, we talked about osmolality already, so apply what you know here. If the water has left the body, we have more concentrated blood, so we will have a high serum osmolality. And this starts to make some of our other lab values go up too. Remember, we have concentrated blood, the water has left. Our serum sodium goes up because we have less water to dilute uh, dilute it. Our serum BUN and even our hemoglobin hematocrit might start to creep up a little bit because we have less water to dilute them. So a lot of those lab values start to look high because there's less water in the body and everything is more concentrated. Now, what about the urine again? It's the opposite. So because all the water is leaving the body through the urine, our urine looks really dilute and our urine osmolality is low. And the specific gravity of our urine, which is really relating to the density of the urine and how well our urine is concentrated, that's low too. So what do we do for these patients? They're dehydrated and they're urinating a lot. That's really our focus. Well, as per usual, we wanna treat the cause. However, if if the cause is not immediately treatable, let's say they have a brain tumor that can't be resected this instant, we need to figure out if they have central or neurogenic or nephrogenic DI. Are they not making enough or are they just insensitive to what's being made? To figure this out, to figure out are we insensitive or are we not making enough? We will often give something called desmopressin or DDAVP or even vasopressin. These are all synthetic forms of ADH. So if we notice that giving ADH fixes the problem, what does that tell us? Think about it. If it works, that means that all I needed was more ADH. I had central DI. I wasn't making enough. However, if we give a patient with diabetes insipidus some ADH and nothing happens, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that wasn't the problem. We were already making enough ADH. So giving more isn't going to help, but our kidneys were not responding to it. They aren't responding to the ADH my body is making, so they aren't going to respond to synthetic ADH. I give them either. So now, now we know what kind of DI we have. It's nephrogenic. So that being said, if our patient has central diabetes insipidus, we give them ADH because they're not making enough. So let's help them. Let's give them some more. If they have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we actually give them thiazide diuretics and put them on a low sodium diet, which is really more supportive than curative care. So now, regardless of what kind of diabetes insipidus we have, central or nephrogenic, we know that these patients are dehydrated, so they need fluids. However, we like to give these patients hypotonic fluids. And that kind of makes sense, right? We already have very concentrated blood, so we don't want to give very concentrated fluids. We give crystalloids, such as half-normal saline, also known as 0.45% sodium chloride, maybe D5W, also known as 5% dextrose in water. Both of those fluids are hypotonic, so thus we help bring the balance of water to stuff kind of back to normal. Now, as we're administering these hypotonic fluids, we need to keep a very close eye on the patient's electrolytes and watch for any changes and then replace those electrolytes accordingly. 
Additionally, because we have a dehydrated, hypovolemic patient, we need to keep an eye on their blood pressure, their heart rate, their I's and O's, their weight, urine-specific gravity. All of those things will tell us how dehydrated our patient is and how our treatment is working. We also want to keep a close eye on their level of consciousness. Remember, changes in level of consciousness can give us a heads up about perfusion, but also about sodium levels. So remember, sodium levels can impact our patient's neurological status and their level of consciousness. So we need to monitor monitor level of consciousness just as close as our sodium levels. All right, so now let's move to the other end of the spectrum. So we've already talked about DI. Remember, less letters, less ADH, less water in the body, so more water in the urine. Now we're looking at SIADH, which is more letters, more ADH, more water in the body, so less water in the urine. So SIADH happens because of the failure of a negative feedback loop. So remember, typically when our body secretes ADH, remember any sign that we're low on blood volume or low on water in the body, typically our body tries to keep a balance. We notice that we need more ADH, we secrete some ADH, and then we kind of slow down or we stop secretion of ADH shortly after so things don't get out of hand, we don't overcorrect. That's a negative feedback loop. It's basically slowing itself down. However, in SAADH, we're not slowing down. We have lots and lots and lots of unopposed ADH secretion. We're not diluting urine because we're holding on to all this water in the body. Now, think back to DI for a second. In diabetes insipidus, we're dehydrated. So a lot of our lab values were high because they were concentrated, our serum osmolality, our serum sodium, et cetera. So the opposite is true for SAADH. We now have watered down lab values. So we actually have low serum sodium, but we call this specific type of low serum sodium dilutional hyponatremia. It's really, really specific to identify the cause of that hyponatremia. And this is really important. We don't just have low sodium. We have low sodium in our blood because it's watered down so much. We've diluted it so much. So what causes SADH? So often we focus on the brain, but also uh, like uh, brain tumors, malignancy, actually respiratory illness can trigger SADH as well. But really the bottom line is that the negative feedback loop that's slowing down this ADH secretion process that should be happening in our brain is not happening. If our patient has a head injury or a brain infection like a brain abscess or meningitis or even a hemorrhagic stroke, tuberculosis, lung cancers, even pneumonia, COPD, and even due to certain medications such as oxytocin or antidepressants, all of those have been shown to trigger secretion of ADH. So as is the case with diabetes insipidus, SIADH can also be idiopathic, where we basically are not really sure why they are producing so much unopposed ADH. So now our patient with SIADH is sitting in front of us. What will they look like? Well, this shouldn't be much tougher than figuring out what a patient with diabetes insipidus looks like. We remind ourselves, too much ADH, too much water in the body. So we're seeing a lot of signs of fluid overload. We don't necessarily see a lot of edema, but we will see hypervolemia. We'll see signs of hypertension potentially. Now, because there's too much water in the body, our blood work is diluted. We have a low serum sodium. We have a low serum osmolality. And because all the water is kind of staying in the body, our urine output is concentrated. So we have high urine osmolality. Now, remember, we also have that dilutional hyponatremia, which really becomes an issue later on if we don't address this. And our patients have lots of water in the body. So we start to see weight gain and some of our lab values get diluted. Our serum BUN, creatinine, albumin, and yes, our sodium. All of these start to drop. So what do we do for our patient that is water overloaded, our patient with SAADH? Well, we need to get rid of that water. So furosemide or Lasix can be given, which is our strong diuretic, our loop diuretic, and this will cause the patient to urinate more. And we can also reduce the patient's sensitivity to all of this ADH that's being produced. And we do that by giving a drug called Declamycin. Now, I keep emphasizing dilutional hyponatremia for a reason. Low sodium levels put our patients at risk for what? Seizures. So in a patient whose sodium level starts to drop often below 125 or 120, we need to be putting them on seizure precautions. 
Think back to what you know about seizure precautions. What do we do? Pause the presentation and quickly think, what do you do for a patient who's in seizure precautions? So these seizure precautions include keeping the bed in a low position, low to the ground, place them in a room close to the nurse's station. We pad the side rails of the bed and keep them up. We make sure that we have suction equipment in the room. And sometimes it means we place the patient on video monitoring so we can record seizures. And we also don't want to keep hazards nearby them. We need to keep those out of the way. So like any unnecessary equipment that could cause them harm during a seizure. Now, dilutional hyponatremia, especially below 125 or 120, we are on high alert for seizures, but we also may end up placing these patients on an anticonvulsant drug, such as phenytoin or dilantin, because they're at such high risk, we are kind of trying to get ahead of the game here and giving them a drug that could prevent seizures. So in addition to keeping a very close eye on their lab values, we don't want to make that dilutional effect worse. Thus, we tend to restrict PO fluids in these patients to about 800 to 1,000 milliliters per day. Sometimes this can be really tough, though, for patients being told, you can't have more than a liter of water a day. So we tend to use some strategies like giving them ice chips to chew or a mouth swab. Just remember that ice chips, while they do take longer to consume than just drinking water, that's still oral intake, and we need to be factoring that in. So last, we have diluted blood. We have dilutional hyponatremia. What else can we do? Well, giving these patients hypertonic saline, so things like 3% sodium chloride, that can help correct severely low sodium levels. Just remember, one of the key nursing considerations of administering 3% uh, sodium chloride is that we give it slowly. We typically don't see this given faster than 30 cc's an hour. Remember that that rapid shift in sodium is very, very dangerous, and that can cause fluid to shift out of the brain too quickly, causing serious neurological damage. Also, we've, we liked giving uh, hypotonic fluids to our patients with diabetes insipidus because their blood was so concentrated. But in the case of SIADH, we already have dilute lo- blood, so these patients should not get hypotonic fluids like that half-normal saline or D5W. All right, let's see what you've learned. So your patient has had 10 cc's of urine output over the past two hours. They have a low serum osmolality of 155, and their sodium level is 115. So which of the following statement most pertains to this patient? One, she has diabetes insipidus and needs an IV bolus of 1,000 cc's normal saline. Two, she has SIADH and she needs an IV bolus of 1,000 cc's normal saline. Three, she has diabetes insipidus and needs 40 milligrams of furosemide IV. Or four, she has SADH and needs 40 milligrams of furosemide IV. Pause the slide and consider your answer. The correct answer is four. So we're seeing signs of too much water in the body and not enough urine output. She only voided 10 cc's of urine over the past two hours. Remember a rough estimate for normal urine output is about 30 cc's an hour. And her serum osmolality is low, and her serum sodium level is very low. So we have too much water in the body and dilutional hyponatremia. So she has SIADH. She needs to get rid of that water in the body with furosemide or Lasix. Now, what else might you need to do for this woman? What makes you nervous about her? Well, her serum sodium level is dangerously low. She could benefit from a slow rate of 3% normal saline, and we should probably be placing her on seizure precautions as well. Let's look at another question. Which of the following is most consistent with diabetes insipidus? One, fluid volume overload with hypernatremia. Two, fluid volume deficit with hypernatremia. Three, fluid volume overload with hyponatremia. Or four, fluid volume deficit with hyponatremia. Pause the presentation and consider your answer. So the correct answer is fluid volume deficit. So remember, diabetes insipidus, less letters, less water in the body, with hypernatremia because the blood is too concentrated. So our correct answer is number two. Now, one more way to memorize SADH and DI is to make a table. So as I always say, when you're being tested on these topics and you forget everything you've ever been taught, this will hopefully help you. So draw a table with three rows and four columns. And in the first column, you'll write ADH, abnormality. 
and then the subsequent wall columns write A and then S and then U. And for the purposes of this table, A refers to ADH and S refers to serum osmolality and serum sodium and U stands for urine osmolality. So let's see what we get. Our first row will be SADH. Now all you have to remember is that SADH has a lot of letters, so our amount of ADH will be high. So write high in that first box, or an up arrow in that first box. And then because we have so much water in the body, our serum osmolality will be low. So write low or a down arrow in the next box. And then because all the water's in the body, our urine is concentrated, so our urine osmolality will be high. So write high in the U column. Now. Next, we do diabetes insipidus. So you remember that DI is the opposite, less ADH. So low, less water in the body, cause more concentrated blood, high serum osmolality and high serum sodium. And then all the water is leaving via the urine, so the urine osmolality is low. So low goes in the last column. So all you have to remember is ASU, high, low, high, followed by low, high, low.